May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear disciples of Jesus, those of you who've been with us a while may remember that a few years ago now, it's almost been two years, I had an Easter series called The End of Dead. Remember? The End of Dead. And we talked about the words that included the word dead in them and how Jesus' resurrection puts an end to them. So, for example, the end of deadline. We, we don't, as believers, really live with a dead line. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we don't die and go to eternal death. We may die, but what happens? We go to eternal life. So for us, there is no dead line. Now, I'm not going to go back on anything I said then. I have not, that the message has not changed. But we're going to look at something a little bit differently this morning. And that is we want to look at this idea of urgency. Because in our lesson this morning, we get a sense of urgency. Now, it's an urgency that, that tells us time is running out. We, we don't have much time left. At least for us, time may be running out. And, and I'll admit that this urgency for us is then created by sin and its close companion, death. But I have to issue a little bit of a warning here. I understand that death and, and sin cause a false urgency sometimes. As in, Get rich today. Do it today. You don't know how long you have. Suck all the joy out of life now, right? Time is short. Well, that's a false sense of urgency, and that's what we addressed in that sermon series. But there is a proper, a, a, a genuine sense of urgency that sin and death create. And that's the spirit in which we're going to be dealing with urgency in our message this morning. And, and, and it begins with this. St. Mark tells us that John the Baptist had been put into prison. Now, why was that? Well, John the Baptist was no respecter of persons. And when he heard that Herod the Tetrarch, not to be confused with Herod, who had you know, gone and killed the little babies in Bethlehem, not that Herod, but a namesake, one that ruled after him, Herod the Tetrarch had been committing adultery with his brother Philip's wife, whose name ironically was Herodias, and then married her away from his brother. John the Baptist called Herod to repent of his sins. And Herod and Herodias didn't much like that, so they had John the Baptist put in prison. And Mark tells us as soon as Jesus heard that, Jesus went to Galilee. He went to Galilee preaching a very specific news. The good news that the kingdom of heaven was near and to repent and to believe the good news. So Jesus then picked up where John the Baptist had let, left off. And, and there was urgency behind this. Now why? Because Jesus knew that in about three short years, what happened to John the Baptist was going to happen to him. He also was going to be arrested, imprisoned, and executed just like so many of the prophets before him. And so Jesus knew that his time was short, and so there was this sense of urgency. Death, and his, really his ascension, is what created this urgency. And, and sin and death for us create an urgency that life never can. So, in addition to preaching and teaching then, St. Mark tells us that Jesus was going to train up the next group of mess messengers who would follow after him to continue preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. Last week we learned about discipleship uh, through the calling of Matthew or Levi on the, the banks of the Jordan, excuse me, on the banks of the Sea of Galilee at the town of Capernaum. And today we're going to learn some more about discipleship as Jesus walked along those same banks of the Sea of Galilee and he called Simon and Andrew, and then James and John. We'll learn that the call to follow Jesus is not just a call to observe him. It is, but it's more than that. It's a call then to join him in his work. 
And then we'll also learn, as I've said, that death, sin and death, create an urgency that life never does. But what's behind this urgency, and this is what makes it genuine urgency, is not fear. It's not fear of missing out or losing out. It's not fear of failure. What's behind this sense of urgency is a tsunami of God's love. God's love poured into our hearts, and that love then overflowing to the heart's of others because Jesus said what he said I'm, I'm gonna make you fishers of people so that's the work then to which he's called us now that's gonna matter for two reasons it matters first of all because it's likely that no one in this room is going to live another hundred years some of us you know we might make it another 20 30 40 right others we hope make it a lot longer. Some of the younger ones among us, we hope make it, you know, 60, 70, 80, maybe even 90 would be great. Huh? But even they aren't going to live forever, and we're going to need someone to carry on after us. The, the, the other reason this matters is because sin and death are still claiming victims. Every moment of every day, sin and death keep claiming victims. However, God in his love through his son Jesus, has provided the rescue from this dastardly duo. So it's our salvation who calls us today, come, follow me. So let's listen to what St. Mark said. It says, after John, John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. And what was that news? He said, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time had indeed come, and the kingdom of God had indeed drawn near. But the question then is, what's the kingdom of God? What does that mean? You know, a lot of people in our world today don't have that straight. They still wonder what that, that kingdom means. And so it's, it's very good for us to take a few minutes and just remind ourselves, refresh our memories, what this term, the kingdom of God, means. So let's just start with the word kingdom. What's a kingdom? Well, a kingdom is everywhere a king, a supreme ruler, exercises his power and authority over his subjects. Well, in that sense, we would say King Jesus, in this physical sense, is king of the universe, isn't he? He is king over things in heaven and on earth and in hell. And he's demonstrated that. He casts out demons. He goes to hell and preaches victory over them. He, 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 casts, he, he uh, defeats the devil in the wilderness, so he has power over the devil. He makes the sun stand still in the sky. He makes it move backwards. He calms the storms. He, he frees people. He heals people from incurable diseases. He even raises them from the dead. But he also has at his command the angels. And so he truly is king of everything that has been created. But the physical universe is not the only place that Jesus rules as a king. It would not have been good news necessarily to go around proclaiming in the region of Galilee or even in Judea, God is king of the universe. Because they already believe that. In fact, many of their prayers addressed him as such. You know, king of the universe. So they acknowledged that God was the king of the universe. But what people didn't understand was the spiritual message that Jesus was preaching. So what's the spiritual side of it? The spiritual side of it is this. That Jesus not only wanted to reign in the universe, but he wants to rule in human hearts and souls. Now that's invisible, isn't it? So in this way, we can say rightly, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. He, he rules in places we cannot see, and he's done that by defeating enemies that are very real, but enemies we cannot see. God sent Jesus, the king, to destroy those invisible enemies for us. And what were they? Sin, guilt, shame, punishment, everything that has to do with our sin. The power and the control of the devil. God sent him to crush the power of the devil. And then to destroy the works of the devil, which was bringing death into the world. So Jesus was called as our king to fight those invisible enemies, to win a victory for us, and let us share in that. So, 
That's the good news Jesus is preaching. The kingdom of heaven is near. Indeed it is. Jesus was standing right there. And he, by preaching the good news, would begin a rule in their hearts. And that then explains the second part of the message. Repent and believe the good news. Repent. Repentance. That's a message that John the Baptist had been preaching. That's a message that all the prophets before that had been preaching. But what does it mean? It means to admit. To confess. To, to lay your sins at God's feet. Here they are, Lord. I'm guilty of all of these. I'm laying them here and I'm turning away from them. But trusting what? Trusting that God is gracious. And that he sent his son, Jesus, to take those sins away from us. To take them away from God's presence forever. This also is then is what, we're, what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. In the second petition when we say, your kingdom come. We're asking that Jesus would maintain his rule in our hearts. But not only in ours, we want Jesus to extend that gracious rule to the hearts of others where he's not yet ruling. As king. So as I've often taught the catechism students, and they, if there are any here this morning, uh, they may remember this, the second petition's a mission petition. We're asking for the kingdom of God to be spread to the hearts of others too. So, while he preached the good news, Jesus was also working to gather and train messengers to preach it after him, and that's what St. Mark tells us. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James and, and son of Jebedee and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now again, like last week in the calling of Matthew, we should not think that Jesus was some kind of Obi-Wan Kenobi with Jedi Knight, you know, mind trick powers. And he went up to these people he'd never seen before, said, come follow me. And then they went, mm, yes, we will follow you. It's not like that. See, Jesus knew these people and they knew him. We know that from other accounts in the gospel. In fact, likely Andrew and John had also been disciples of John the Baptist. They would have been exposed to Jesus and what, who he was and what it meant for them. But we also know that Andrew had introduced Peter to the Savior. So they, they knew each other already. Perhaps had heard a sermon. Maybe had even seen a miracle or two. And then when Jesus came walking by and said, Come, follow me, they knew. They knew who he was. They, they believed he was the Messiah. Now, did they understand fully what all that meant? No, not yet. But they knew. And, and it's interesting here in, in, in um, Mark's Gospel, there's two things that are stressed. One is the immediacy with which they did that. Immediately, they left their, their nets, their boats, and followed Jesus. They didn't go, you know, well, Jesus, that's a pretty good idea. Uh... I got to do some other things. You, you know, can you hang on while I go take care of some other business? No, it was immediate. Immediately they left everything and followed him. And the other thing that's emphasized with James and John is that they left everything. They left family. They left all the old tools of the former trade, right? The boat, the nets, and everything. They even left hired hands behind. Now they all did that. They all followed immediately. They all left everything they had to follow Jesus. So I know a lot of times the disciples, you know, we can chuckle at their lack of understanding and sometimes they do a few funny and funny things or maybe some things we just don't understand. But you have to give them the credit they, they deserve, really what was worked in them by the Holy Spirit here. That they would follow Jesus immediately and that they would leave everything to do it. Thank God for that. So, when Jesus appeared on the shores of Galilee and, and walked by their boats, we learn that they eagerly followed and left everything to do it. 
Now, what have they been called to? Well, they hadn't been called to faith because, as I've mentioned, they already knew who Jesus was. They already trusted that he was the Messiah. So it wasn't a call to faith. But what was it? It was a call to a change in their life's work and calling. And, and that's Jesus picks up on, hey, you're fishers of fish. I'm calling you to be fishers of people. I'm, gonna, I'm calling you away from one work and to another work. This is one of the ways that these disciples then would deny themselves and follow Jesus. He would, he would train them. He was going to equip them. He was going to fill them with knowledge and understanding of his word. He was going to fill them with love so that they then would be well prepared to carry on the work of preaching the kingdom of God. Now, some have noted that uh, fishermen, like these were, do not usually go out in nets to catch fish so that they can put them in fish tanks. They usually make their money by selling fish in the marketplace. But in order for the fish to be of any good in the marketplace, they have to be dead. So by catching fish, you're sadly putting an end to them, but I might say they're very tasty that way. But interestingly enough, when we go fishing for people, as Jesus says, we do much the same thing. See, it, ironically, we're brought to the end of ourselves. We're, we're essentially drowned in the waters of baptism. We die. Our old self dies. And then what does Jesus do? He raises us to a new life. A new life of faith. And when he does that, then, he also calls us to an additional work. And that is this, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Now, he hasn't called us to leave whatever jobs and occupations we have, as he did for the disciples. But he's called us to do this work in addition, right alongside of the work that we also do, of the occupations that we have. So this following of Jesus then, yes, it includes watching, observation. But following Jesus is more than a call to observation. It's a call to participation, to actually getting out there and doing the work of fishing for people. Now, I am certain that you love Jesus. I am certain you love Jesus who came and gave his life for you to free you from those the nasty sins that you've committed, all of them, the horrible shame and the guilt that go with them, and the, the, the punishment of God that hung over you because of them. I'm sure that you love Jesus because of that. And I am sure that you love Jesus because he has snapped the chains that the devil had snapped on you and by which he would manipulate you. I am sure that you love Jesus because he gave everything and gave himself over to death for you so that he might rise and defeat death in life. And I'm sure that you love Jesus because through some other messenger, he called you to believe the good news. He established his gracious rule in your hearts. And I know, I'm, I'm certain that you love Jesus because of that. So if you love Jesus, wouldn't you also love others whom Jesus loves? It's an interesting dynamic. I'm, I can't think of an exception to it, but perhaps I'll, I'll allow that there may be. If you love a friend, or another relative, then you almost certainly care for and love their children too. I can't think of a relationship, a close relationship I have with a friend or a family member where it doesn't work that way. If anything ever happened to them, or if their children were ever in need, I can't think of a time when I wouldn't do everything I can to help those children. 
and if necessary, to even open up my home to them so they would have a place to call home. Now, if that's true in, a, in the secular world, in our physical, our earthly relationships, then how much more wouldn't it be true in our relationship with Jesus the King? I mean, if you love King Jesus, don't you also love his sons and daughters, his brothers and sisters? And, and it doesn't matter what they look like to you. It doesn't matter what they smell like, what they eat, how they talk, the language they speak, the, the, the idiosyncratic customs they may have. None of that matters to you. What matters most is that the king rules in their hearts, that they, like you, are sons and daughters of the king. But you see, in the family of Jesus, it extends beyond the family. Because King Jesus came to conquer enemies of everybody, even those who don't yet have a personal relationship with him, even those in whose hearts he is not yet ruling as king. Today, as he does every day, Jesus is calling you, come, follow me. But he adds, I will make you fishers of people. And it's love for the king. And it's love for the people that the king loves. That, that moves our hearts to respond just like the disciples responded when Jesus called them. Immediately we say what? Yes, Lord, I will follow you. And if necessary, I will leave everything behind to keep following you. Why does that matter? Well, as a friend of mine likes to say, because hell is really hot and eternity is a really long time and we don't want anyone to go there, right? As far as it depends on us, we want to stuff heaven with as many people as it can possibly hold. Sin and death create an urgency now that life never can. So, follow Jesus. Fish for people. How are you going to do that? I suggest do it one at a time. Do it the way we fish today. Don't take a net. Just take your fishing rod. Do it one person at a time. Think of one person right now in your mind. You know a friend, a, a relative, who, in whose heart Jesus is not ruling as king. I want you to take that person's name and write it on your calendar. I don't care if it's a digital calendar or one at home, paper one you hold in your pocket. Write it on your calendar. And then I want you every day of that month to pray for that person. And then ask God every day to give you opportunities to interact with that person. Then I want you to schedule a time when you are going to call that person and talk to them. And then if possible, schedule a time when you are going to visit that person. Learn about them. Learn what's going on in their life if you don't know. Learn their struggles. Learn their ups. Learn what good things are happening for them. And then provide genuine care and concern for them. And finally, as you get toward the end of that month period, I want you to tell them of the good things Jesus, King Jesus, has done for them. And then the following month, repeat it. You see, that's how you can love Jesus and love others whom Jesus loves. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, often the problem is we just don't love. We don't love you as much as we should. We don't love others as we should. So we, we're praying this morning that you would forgive us for our lack of love. But through your word this morning, you've again poured wonderful love into our hearts. And with that love then, we ask that you would so fill us that we can't help but love you and others. Then give us the opportunities, Jesus, to tell the others of the great things you have done for them. We ask it in your name. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.